Hello and welcome back to Cinema Burger. I'm Scott Berger and I bring you movie reviews from a different perspective. Today we continue our viewer choice series with the number two choice of science fiction with the movie Sunshine. Now Sunshine was released in 2007. It was directed by Danny Boyle and written by Alex Garland. Danny Boyle has directed such movies as Train Spotting, 28 Days Later, and Slumdog Millionaire. Alex Garland has written such movies as 28 Days Later, Dread, Ex Machina, and Annihilation. So the plot of Sunshine is the Earth is dying. It's the year 2057 because the sun is almost burnt out. So an astronaut team is sent to the sun to reignite it using a fission bomb. So we've seen a lot of these types of space apocalypse movies where either the Earth or the sun is dying and we need some last, last ditch effort mission to fix whatever the problem is. Now in these types of movies there's always complications, something happens, people have to get sacrificed, things like that. There's been a lot of those like Armageddon, Space Cowboys, uh, The Martian, but let's talk about what makes Sunshine so special and why it's been under the radar, because it has been. Well, first of all, the effects still look great in the year 2020. This movie came out 13 years ago, and it's the effects are very subtle. Nothing is really noticeable in terms of special effects. Now, the crew themselves is made up of Chris Evans, Cliff Curtis, Rose Byrne, Killian Murphy, Benedict Wong, all very logical. But their decision making, I like to describe it as brutally logical. Like, even when they have to sacrifice things or people, it's one person versus seven billion people, so it's obviously you're gonna choose the Earth over one person. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, if you will. And Chris Evans especially, his character is the most brutally logical. At one point, they, uh... Now this space mission is technically called the Icarus 2, because seven years prior, another space mission, the Icarus 1, was sent, and they lost contact seven years ago. So now this is the second mission being sent to reignite to the sun. So while on their mission, they hear radio transmission from the Icarus 1. Now, they think of a rescue mission, but if they go off course, they may not have enough oxygen or fuel to get back or get to their mission. And they're weighing the options because they check and possibly the nuclear bomb from Icarus 1 is still intact. So that would give them double the amount of bombs to use to reignite the sun. Because all of this is technically theoretical that the nuclear fission bomb would reignite the sun. So they're thinking, oh, we could you have two bombs instead of one. But Chris Evans' character really doesn't want to go off course because it's a because they don't have enough fuel or whatever, and they really have to decide. Now, instead of taking a vote on what to do, the captain of the ship makes a choice because the captain has the highest ranking. And also, I think the captain is a scientist, so the scientist makes the decisions too based on science facts and theory because why would a communications officer, for example, know about nuclear fission? Now, the character played by Cliff Curtis, he likes to stare at the sun. Now, even though it's burning out, they still need UV sensors and shields to look at the sun. And it's almost like a drug to him. It's very interesting because he looks at the sun with like 2% like intensity or so and then he even raises it a little higher and it's like addicting since the sun is almost out and most people haven't really seen the sun in full force even on earth for many years. So now already making this decision to go to the Icarus 1 
there won't be enough oxygen for everyone to get there or even the journey home. So they're going to have to choose who lives and who dies, as is typical in these movies. Now, once again, Chris Evans was completely against this idea to go in the first place. And Killian Murphy seems to be the one who wants to take the chance because he's the nuclear physicist. Because he's basically saying, yeah, all this is theoretical, we don't even know if one bomb will work, but two bombs are better than one. So, on the way there, they make calculations and stuff, but apparently they forgot to adjust the, the shields. Benedict Wong's character made the calculations and messed up, so they have to literally go out on the sh side of the ship and angle the shields down so they don't get overexposed. So here's already an op a chance for someone to die. And of course, someone di the captain dies because he's the captain. So that's one crew member down. So now Benedict Wong feels like really bad and he put on suicide watch because he feels so bad that he fucked up everything. And they're not even sure if their own payload will work because of the sun's exposure, so now they really have no choice but to go to the Icarus 1 because that's possibly the only payload they have left now. So we get glimpses of the Icarus 1 crew. We see their captain played by Mark Strung. And we see flashes of the Icarus 1 crew happy and partying. And so we get to Icarus 1. It's all dusty. They get on board. Now, the ship itself can't function, but the payload is fine. And they see what happened on the ship. Everyone's dead. Now, only the captain is alive, played by Mark Strong. But he's all, like, mutilated or something. He basically went crazy and thought he was talking to God. And, and he killed everybody on the ship. And Chris Evans found him. Now more things go wrong, the computer system on the Icarus 2 goes to autopilot and the airlock gets released connecting Icarus 1 to Icarus 2, so there's only one spacesuit in the area where three of the crew members are, so they wrap themselves in look what looks like those space blankets, those silver blankets, to supposedly shield them from the cold to get back to Icarus 2, which, first of all, is really implausible. Because even if you're in space without a proper suit for, like, three seconds, you're gonna die. But somehow, Chris Evans survives jumping in space for, like, 30 seconds. And he makes it. One of the other crew members who is now technically in command because of the captain dying... He basically is like, I should live because I'm in charge, but he gets left behind. But he's only a communications officer, so, like, seriously, what will he be useful for with nuclear fission stuff? Now, because of the sun exposure, the oxygen fields in Icarus 2 have been kind of destroyed. And there's a fire and stuff, so they're already screwed now. They're most likely none of them are gonna live after this mission, but they've accepted that because of their brutal logic. Michelle Yeoh plays another crew member who's in charge of the oxygen fields. Now, as they're still trying to figure out who needs to live and die, they figure since Benedict Wong's character is on suicide watch and wants is in a catatonic state, they figure maybe let him kill himself. Because he's, I guess, expendable. Now, Chris Evans, once again, is like, yeah, maybe just let him. Because they need a certain amount of people with alive with the amount of oxygen they have. They technically would have to get rid of three people and already two... One is dead, I believe. So they still need two more. So they... They're like, we're not going to draw straws. Because a lot of movies, they do, like, let's draw straws to see who does the dangerous thing. So, the other things start happening on the Icarus 2 ship. The coolant 
was exposed, so they have to like basically put the ship back in so it can like have power because Icarus 2 lost power. So Chris Evans has to like go in and fix that and it's like below freezing temperature water. So it's revealed later on that Mark Strong's character has snuck onto the Icarus 2 and he's killing people. He was the one who let the airlock go for the Icarus 1 and he killed Benedict Wong because we find him dead. They think that he killed himself but it was Mark Strong's character. So he basically went crazy and said he was talking to God and that God told him to basically kill everybody. So he sabotaged the Icarus 1 mission and now he's trying to sabotage the Icarus 2 mission. So now we have our antagonist shows up pretty late in the movie. So now Killian Murphy's character is stuck in an airlock. Michelle Yeoh's character is been killed by Mark Strong. So it's really just Killian Murphy, Rose Byrne, and Mark Strong. Now here's where the... Up until now, this movie has been very well done. It's very subtle. It develops his characters a little differently than other... These, like, space movies. Because everyone is very logical and cold and calculating because they're scientists. There's... No one is like, oh, we gotta save this one person to help everyone. It's like, no, you gotta do what's best for the mass population, which I really admire about this movie. But here's where the end gets a little weird. Killian Murphy escapes the airlock. Chris Evans is dead now. Cliff Curtis gets killed by Mark Strong, I believe. So they're basically trying to launch the payload, and the images, the way it's filmed near the end, it's very, like, flashy, and there's a lot of jump cuts and things like that, and there's not a lot of dialogue at the end. It just, it just feels very odd, because, like, the film keeps, like, pausing for a second, to just freeze on the characters. Um, and earlier in the movie, Silly and Killian Murphy shows Rose Byrne how the bomb would go off theoretically, and you see that again when he actually sets off the bomb. Now, basically, it's like this: the bomb goes into the the sun. They're on it basically because they're in the payload. There's like a area for a crew crew members to be. They're basically like in the sun, but they aren't dying yet. So the bomb goes off. Everyone on the Icarus has now died, and the sun has been reignited, saving everyone on Earth. Now they cut to Earth, and it only just looks like it's just very snowy. Like they show an area and it's just covered in snow. So. Like, if the sun is dying, I guess it's to the point where it's just kind of cold all year round. It's not like nuclear winter or something or like below freezing all the time. That's never really fully explained. I guess this is like the last chance they have before it gets to death, like global death level situations on Earth. So, despite the odd abstract ending... The film overall is very well done. It's gone under the radar. Like, most people don't know about this movie. I would give it a, a 4 out of 5 burgers. Just because of the ending is a little odd. And it kind of... I feel like it almost... It doesn't really derail the movie. But it kind of, like, stops it for a second. And it's like, alright, what, what are they doing here? In terms of the weird film techniques. And... While revealing Mark Strong, the character from the first Icarus, is on board killing people. It's like, on top of everything that's going wrong, now we have space murderers. Which makes sense. It's But that part feels a little generic, because it's... You know, like, people are dying left and right. It's kind of like Alien, I guess. But everything in, up until then is very well done and feels unique, especially of the characters' motivations. So, 
I would definitely check this movie out. It's not well known, but it's definitely worth watching, especially for Killian Murphy and Chris Evans' performance, as well as the writer-director team of Danny Boyle and Alex Garland. And I'm Scott Berger, and I'll see you next time.